Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to worship. We're glad that you made it this morning. If you are here for the first time, if you somehow found our uh, church gathering, if you followed some link or maybe someone invited you, we're so glad that you made it. Um, we hope you feel welcome. I know it's weird maybe to feel welcome in an environment like this right now, but we want to do the best that we can. Uh, so there's a connect box. There's a little button on the top of the screen. You can just click it, uh, a form will come up, and you can just give any information that you're comfortable giving. And we just love to serve you if we can in this season. Maybe we can answer some questions or, or help you in this season. Um, so that, that, that form is there. We'd love to connect with you if we can. Okay, friends, just a reminder, we're in this new sermon series on mission with Jesus, and we suggested a few books for the month of August this past week. One was Free at Last by Carl Ellis, and the other, which partnered more closely with this sermon series, um, Out of the Salt Shaker. Um, I want to encourage you to engage in those resources if you can. I think those would be edifying and will be uh, leading us to think about what does it mean to be a church more visibly public and missionally fruitful in this season, okay? All right, well, let me call you to worship. And if you feel comfortable enough to stand while we sing. And as I read this, read this with me. Read the, the uh, italicized portions with me. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul, awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. Let's sing together. Come on, let's put our hands together.
because our God is great, we will sing your praise and pour forth your fame. We will bless your name. Let everyone give thanks because our God is great. Amen. Well, let's pray together and read the italicized portions aloud with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen.
become a talent show Lead us back to life in you We've been throwing heavy stones Lead us back to life in you Darkest deep, neither pain nor poverty. There is nothing that can keep my redeemer's love from me. All alone, though I may feel all the world my enemy, still there's no. Never failing, come what may He has purchased my forgiveness And has washed my sins away Although burdened by the weight of great trials Never failing, come what may He has purchased my forgiveness And has washed my sins away Oh, the love of my Redeemer Never failing, come what may He has purchased my forgiveness And has Passing days and through all eternity, I will never cease to praise my Redeemer's love for me. Amen. Well, read this with me from First John. 
See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Our God is extravagant in his love toward us. We who were once enemies have been brought near, reconciled, and adopted as God's very own children. So as brothers and sisters, let's greet each other now in peace. The reading from God's word this morning is from 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 17. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is a word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Apostles Church. My name is Jamie Leahy, and I am one of the pastors Uh, at Apostles Church Uptown. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning as we continue our sermon series on mission with Jesus. Uh, It's Sunday, friends, and today we get to hear again from God's Word. So far in our sermon series, we've heard about how we are called to, to bear witness to God, to humble ourselves as Christ did and serve our neighbor. And today we will hear about how mission with Jesus calls us to be a lover, The call to love is at the heart of Christianity that shouldn't surprise anyone. But I imagine how much do we ask, how much do we think of ourselves as lovers, or that Jesus is the great lover of our souls? Our passage today begins where the Apostle John says to us, "The, the old commandment is the word that you've heard, and at the same time it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you. It's true in him and then you, because the darkness is passing away and the true love is already shining. John here is talking about the commandment to love, to love God and to love our neighbors. And this isn't a new idea, but one from the Old Testament all the way to Jesus and now to the church in the New Testament. It's old and it's also new. Here's how. In the Old Testament, God commanded that in Deuteronomy 6, 5, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And in Leviticus 19, 18, he commanded that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. When Jesus in the stories of the Gospels was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus masterfully summarized the Old Testament law with these two. And it was important to get both. That in the Gospels, Jesus isn't teaching us something new. 
but he renews, he clarifies and sharpens to a point the commandments of God. And so here, John the Apostle is also not teaching us something new, but he, he renews and clarifies and sharpens to a point the centrality of the love of God and the love of nature, not just for religious people, but for all of reality. After all, the universe was forged from the love of the Father and the Son by the Holy Spirit. It was light and love at the beginning, and it will be light and love at the end. In verse 1 and 2 of our chapter, we see that at the cross of Jesus Christ, we see most clearly the command to love, that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. That is, he's our wrath bearer for the things we've done wrong. And not just our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Now, when John says the whole world, he's not pro proclaiming a kind of universalism here, but he is trumpeting the fullness and the wideness and the deepness of God's love. No one is excluded. God desires the whole world to be saved. And for a love so wide and so welcoming, we see how hatred simply doesn't belong. The scripture says, whoever says that he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness. John points out just how incongruent hatred is to the command to love others. It is as different as light and darkness. But what exactly is hatred? That might seem really obvious, but there is some nuance in how the Bible discusses hatred. After all, we pretty regularly see God express his hatred for sin, or hypocrisy, or injustice in the world. The book of Isaiah and the Psalms are full of this kind of language. And so we can see that there could be a kind of holy hatred. However, the hatred that John points to here is antithetical to the things of God. He calls it darkness and blindness, and he points to it as the natural way of the world apart from God, part of this present but passing evil age. So a couple things of note. Obviously, love here denotes the absence of hatred, the absence of trying to hurt or exploit someone. But we also see that love is active. The Apostle John warns us to love in deed and truth, not word and talk. James, in his letter, warns us that faith without works is dead. Similarly, hatred can be active, actively trying to harm someone. And Honestly, hatred is pretty popular these days, whether it's for liberal progressives or conservatives, for Trump voters, or for the gay community, or for, the, for Christian communities, or people of other skin colors and countries and religions. But however, unlike love, ha hatred can also be passive. Hatred is twofold. It's a, it's a force active in the, in the heart to destroy and harm others and also a failure to love others, even apathy. Proverbs 13, 24 provides this interesting illustration. It says, whoever doesn't discipline his child hates him. That is, whoever doesn't actively set out to correct and teach and shape his child, that kind of apathy is a way of expressing hatred, a lack of love. And lastly, love is the expression of fellowship with God. This is the major theme of John's first letter. If we are in him, we will love others like he loves us. And how does he do that? Look at the cross. There's no hatred in him towards us, and so there can't be hatred in us towards others. So today we're going to explore what it means to be a lover in the way just John describes here. We're going to talk about love crooked, love hindered, and love matured. In a world full of slogans about what love is and what love isn't, we do need some help to see clearly here what Christian love is. To be lovers, we must first see God's love towards us, a kind of love crooked. Let me explain with a brief story. In his book, Mortal Lessons, surgeon David Selzer tells us, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in a palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. She will be thus from now on. The surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh, I can promise you that, and nevertheless, 
To remove the tumor in her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell on the evening lamplight isolated from me. Private. Who are they, I ask myself, and this wry mouth that I have made, who gaze and touch each other so generously, greedily. The young woman speaks, will, will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve is cut. She nods and is silent, but the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It is kind of cute. And all at once, I know who he is. I understand and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with a god. Unmindful of me, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am so close that I can see how he twists his lips to accommodate hers and to show her that their kiss still works. Selzer here bears witness to an expression of what divine love looks like for us, as illustrated in Jesus Christ. In Christianity, God did not make us climb the mountain to get to him. He did not make us ascend Jacob's ladder into the heavens. No. In Jesus Christ, God's love comes down from on high, in quality with God, not a thing to be grasped. In incarnation, Jesus moves into the neighborhood, not into a really nice building in an ugly neighborhood. He doesn't erect a palace in Galilee. Love puts on the same weakness. Love lives in the same conditions. Love gets low to be with the lowly. Our lover, Jesus Christ, twisted and contorted his own fullness of life to impress his love on our sinful, broken lives. What a lover he is. And for those of you, and there are so many of us that have been laid low emotionally, financially, and spiritually in this season, do you see that Jesus Christ made himself low so that he could be with you in your lowliness? Friends, let that, let that gladden your hearts. Let that encourage your souls, dear children of God, if you feel low, Jesus is with you. Let's talk about love hindered. God directs us how to love others with his commandments. Yet, when we set out to love others, to, to twist our lives, to get low like they are, we experience tremendous difficulty. Our own discouragements make us listless or apathetic. After all, aren't our own troubles enough? Later, in 1 John chapter 5, we read that God's commandments aren't burdensome. And Psalm 119 gives us the picture of the psalmist learning to understand God's ways and to live in them. Why then is it so difficult? Why, why is it so confusing? If we find the commandment to love others burdensome or recognize our apathy, does it mean that we're not in the light? No, I, I don't think it means that at all. But let me ask you this. Do you find your acts of loving service hindered by insecurity or anxiety or fear? I know I do. Sometimes rather than finding God's commandments joyful and life-giving, I can feel so drained and exhausted by all the turmoil that's created in me. And maybe that's just me, but I don't think so. What should we do? Should we simply resolve that it's difficult? Yes, yeah, we should agree that it is difficult. But how can we wisely continue the struggle to see our love of others less hindered? I would offer three things. We, we need to ask God to remove the hindrances from loving others and from loving Him. As we grow in our desire to love others, we will increasingly, we will increasingly yearn for hindrances to be removed, not solely for our benefit or merely because we're wearied by our sins, but so that others might be loved better by us and God glorified more through us. Secondly, we have to repent. Our resistance to loving others is often rooted in our own selfishness and self-seeking ways. We are increasingly freed of these things when we stop ignoring and making excuses for them and confess and repent. 
If you haven't yet seen John Stark's interview with Akemeni Uwan, I highly recommend it. She speaks beautifully and authoritatively of this truth. And thirdly, our love needs to mature, and so do we. So let's talk about love matured. This is where we'll spend the rest of our time this morning. Strangely, I think the primary hindrance of the fullness and effectiveness of our love for others is Christian maturity. Does that surprise you? A maturing Christian will love differently than an immature one, and, and our maturing is the outpouring and the overflow of life with the loving God. Let me say that again, as John the Apostle emphasizes in his letter, our maturing as Christians is the outcome of our fellowship with God. If your anger or insecurity hinders your love for others, then who you are needs to change even more than what you do. You don't necessarily need another volunteer opportunity or a community group or a city to live in. You need a renewed you. We need to do far less pretending to be patient and general, gentle rather than actually at our core asking the Spirit of God to make us more patient and gentle. And I'm trying here, friends, as we talk about Christianity, a Christian maturity, to avoid productivity language. Maturity is not a product. Even phrases like pursuing Christ's likeness or increasing in the fruit of the Spirit have these hanging on some achievement-driven language for our spiritual development. Akemeni Uwan again reminded us recently that the process of maturing, which we also call sanctification, growing in Christian character, is it's progressive. It's not linear. Assembly lines are linear. You put raw material in on one end, and on the other end the product comes out. But our physical development, well that's progressive. For instance, babies do not grow one inch per week or per month until they've reached their intended height. It's not a matter if you provide them with a certain number of meals that they will grow a certain number of inches in that next year. Tweens and teens have growing pains and growth spurts. And so do our souls when we fellowship with God over time. We need to recalibrate how we think about life and progress and maturity. A lot of us have just bought into the lie that if it's not accomplished by 30 or 40, all of our potential is gone. And we sometimes transfer that idea to our spiritual inner lives. And yet the Bible bears witness to a very different timeline. Abraham gets his promise from God and a son at 100 years old. Moses doesn't begin leading the nation of Israel until he's 80. And he spends almost all of his time before that in complete obscurity. In several of the interviews that John has recently done, people have pointed to a second half of life intimacy with God that's post 50 years old. You may feel like your life is over, but really, God is just getting started. So friends, let's resist being discouraged. He has so much more for you. And even more than that, he has so much more of himself. For you. And so John the Apostle here gives us three categories for us to talk about, three categories of Christian maturity, and obviously like any family, you're going to find all three in one body. And as we push into that, here's my, here's my rough definition of Christian maturity based on 1 John. Through our fellowship with God, our assurance of God's fatherly, steadfast love for us, and the completeness of our salvation in Christ deepens, despite our feelings, emotions, trials, circumstances, and the loss of the crowds. This fellowship renews our desires and longings, acts of neighborly love, and character. Friends, time with God, our fellowship, and our and our theology, our understanding of the salvation and the gospel and service uh, to others in work and family and neighbor and church, all of those things are rolled up into this. But none of those things is discarded. But it is, friends, it is a process. It is a growth. So let, let's talk quickly about Christian maturity and the three categories that John gives us. Uh, little children, uh, young men, and fathers. So first, little children. John the Apostle gives us two qualities, two qualities of all, children, of all Christians. John assures us that these little children Christians, uh, he assures them of two things. You know the Father, 
and your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. We see that God is not simply holy, divine, powerful, or even Lord. He's also our Father. Father, the uniquely Christian name for God. That those who are born of God become children of God. A new Christian may not know a great deal about the Christian life. She may have many besetting sins that need to be dealt with, but at her core, she's a Christian because the Spirit has made her born of God. We call this regeneration. John Newton, the old pastor, English pastor in the 1800s, who writes really excellently about Christian maturity in his pastoral letters, gives us a, a few characteristics of these baby Christians. He points out that they, they feel God's grace and love, but, but don't really understand it very well yet. Consequently, they tend to base their justification on their sanctification. In other words, they believe that God loves them for their avoidance of sin or their faithfulness in prayer and religious duties. They rely on the feeling of God's nearness for their assurance. And obviously relying on feelings of assurance creates a lot of anxiety and instability when things are hard. And it can create a lot of pride when things are going well. Negative feelings and life circumstances and even spiritual regress can be pretty hard to handle. So baby Christians love and serve others often with mixed motives. It can be inconsistent and hard to sustain. And it's not that this is wrong-headed or even just sinful, but it's mature. It's immature. And truthfully, if we hold fast to Jesus, we won't, we won't stay that way. Do you remember what it was like when you first met Jesus Christ? I remember this too. Lots of zeal, not very much wisdom. Now, next we have the, the young men or the youths. John speaks to us here, the youths. Hey, the youths. John encourages them with this. He says, hey, youths, you are strong. The word of God abides in you. You have overcome the evil one. And that describes many of you who are listening now. You are trying to live the Christian life according to God's word. You're fighting the good fight, and it is confusing sometimes, and difficult and even vague. And here comes John the Apostle to urge you along. He says, you're stronger than you think because God's power is at work in you. His work is living and active in you. And already, you have overcome the evil one who gives you so much trouble. But you might ask, how does John know? He doesn't know me. He doesn't know what I'm struggling with. He doesn't know how long I've been struggling. How does he have so much certainty? Well, John's confidence, friends, it's not in you. It's in the one who saved you and has promised to bring you through to the end. When we wonder what a maturing Christian is, how will I grow in loving others? Christian assurance is central to it. More trusting in the grace of the gospel and less trusting in how I'm measuring up. More assurance in God, less in myself. More resting in God and less in me. Do these struggles, do these feel familiar to you? Do you feel now, even at this moment, like a more sinful person than you did before? Newton would say this is a sign of progress. Why? Well, with the gospel to assure us, we are freer to see how sinful and selfish our hearts are without it being totally traumatic or without simply denying it. And so God can open us up to deeper self-knowledge and a fuller repentance. The gospel works in us more deeply to get below our sinful actions to the deeper motives of our hearts, showing us our self-righteousness and idolatry and freeing us more and more. It reminds me a little bit of like, you ever have those mornings when you get dressed for work in your dimly lit apartment and you go to work, maybe you're at work all day and an hour before the day is over, you step into that really well lit bathroom and you look in the mirror and suddenly, oh, this shirt has a huge stain on it. Sometimes I think it's a little bit like that, that for sinful people to come into the brightness and the holiness of God, to be exposed by God to God's beauty, starts to show the spots on us we just haven't seen before. And Tim Keller, in talking about this, points out that this kind of a shock, 
this kind of like, oh, look how dirty I am kind of moment can block our fellowship with God. There are even times when it knocks real Christians out of church. We start to wonder, am I really a Christian? Have I hardly changed? I've hardly changed at all. Do you feel that way this morning? Friends, we must use the gospel to assure our hearts even as we repent. We must sing as hymn writer William Copper does. What peaceful hours I once enjoyed, how sweet their memory still. But they have left an aching void the world will never fill. Return, O holy dove, return, sweet messenger of rest. I hate the sins that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast. A maturing Christian increasingly longs to be freed from these hindrances, these sins that made thee mourn, so that we can love, uh, love God and love others more fully. So to all my youths in Christ who are watching, hear this encouragement. You are strong. The word of God abides in you. You have overcome the evil one. So keep going. And lastly, fathers, and this will be quick. For many of us, we envision our lives 20 years from now or maybe 40. Where will you be 20 or 40 years from now? God will be with you. And John tells us twice, you know him. Fathers, you know him who is from the beginning. There, there's this quality about mature Christian men and women who know God not just as father, but as the eternal thrice God. That, that thing, that presence, that abiding that Jesus talks about in the later chapters of John 15, 16, and 17. And they enjoy a blessed communion with him. They've begun to see their sin and all its evil and in its darkness also makes them the recipients for the mercy of the merciful one and for the grace of the gracious one. And so mature men and women, Tim Keller points out, can one, face the routine negatives of life with a sense of God's love. Two, have a profound self-knowledge. They, they really understand how things tick under the surface. And lastly, the knowledge of sin in them has not dimmed, but brightens joy in the grace of God. It's when we see how bad we are, we see how great our Savior is, how beautiful and complete his salvation for us, and we are more assured. And the last thing I would say is, and you may have heard this in my definition earlier about the loss of crowds. If I summarize chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, there, there's a lot there and we have very little time left. But the, this part about the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, I, I, would, I would simply summarize it like this. Beware the crowds. Eugene Peterson says that church leaders frequently warn against drugs and sex, but at least in America, almost never against the crowds. And I really do feel that crowds are a worse danger, far worse than drink or sex. Is that surprising? And yet I think the Apostle John implores us to something similar here. He says, do not love the world. And he's not talking about the physical world or even the things in it or even so much the people, but the fallen order of the world, the passing darkness, the sins and systems of the world, the power and the injustice and the exploitation, and yes, even the popular opinion that destroy God's very good creation and resist his coming. Jesus called this the broad way. Many there are that tread the broad way. But it is the maturing Christian who will more so and more so live for the audience, for the audience of one and lose the affirmation of the crowds. Often, friends, the most loving thing to do is very unpopular with the passing darkness. We need deeper repentance and experience of the grace of God. And if we are in Christ and continue to look to him, it's coming. Our increasing reliance on the grace of God will produce in us more stability, more creativity, more longevity, and vitality for loving others and fulfilling Christ's command. Love one another as I have loved you.
Let's pray for his help. Father, I pray for all those who are watching this now um, or whenever, that you would speak to them by your spirit of the assurance of your love and the completeness of their salvation in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that your spirit would bear witness to their spirit of your love and presence with them and that they, this would f increasingly free them to better and more fully love their neighbors and love you. God, we have so many hindrances and we are so impatient even with ourselves, but you are our patient and loving Father. Would you help us to learn what it means to mature? Would you help us understand how you're working in us and to be patient with your well-timed and masterful work and trusting ourselves, our lives, and our inner lives to you. Lord, would you cause our church to blossom in intimacy with you and good works for the good of our city? And would you sustain us in that by your presence with us? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice calling out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me to life. I know that it is fear. Let's hear God's word from Romans 12. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, 
but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Even as we're physically distant from each other, let's hear this call to be devoted to one another in spirit. Our identity as the body of Christ is more fundamental than the ways in which we're far from one another in a season of pandemic. So as we continue to sing, and as we use this time to worship through giving, let's celebrate together the fellowship we've been given with God and with each other. Let's sing. Father, we, we ask that you would give us 
such a deep grasp of your mercy, such a deep grasp of your redemption in our life that it might unite us. It might send us out very clear-headed who we are in Christ. That we are one body, but we're one body in Christ. The Holy Spirit is keeping us unified. Not our cultural commonalities, not our social commonalities, not even our ethnic commonalities, but the presence and the power of Christ is keeping us as one body. So I pray you would send us out as a church so deeply united together that when we become more visible and open as a church in the coming months, um, that we might be just, we might be a fellowship so deep and so fruitful in the mission. So help us, Lord now. And it's the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, friends, it was good to sing with you. It's good to be with you today. Just two reminders. One, um, just we, we've been suggesting two books to partner with our season. One, Free at Last by Carl Ellis, and the other, Out of the Salt Shaker by Rebecca Pippert. Um, I think those would be an encouragement to us. So just be mindful of those resources. And also, um, we're a I don't know, one or two weeks into August, and I just want to encourage you uh, to be keeping our church financially healthy as we are beginning our new fiscal year. We began it in July, and we're now into August, and so I just want to encourage you to keep going, keep our church financially healthy. It's good for our city to have financially healthy churches, organizationally healthy churches, and so I uh, wanted to encourage you to to stay faithful in that way, especially if you are a, a member and a part of this church. All right, we're going to go and take the Lord's Supper together. Just so have your bread, your cup, and there's going to be a Zoom link to follow. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see your faces. So I'll see you over there. Bye.